for our third and, and final talk of the day. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Gaspar Tkacic with us from IST Austria. Um, Gaspar was in the, uh, among other accomplishments, he was in sort of the first generation of young faculty to join IST and, and has played a, uh, an important role in shaping the, the environment there, which, which um, is now very lively and, uh, and I think quite special. Um, he's worked on a wide range of problem, theoretical problems in biological physics, uh, ranging from the very molecular things that he's going to talk about today to uh, problems um, more connected to neuroscience with various stops in between. Um, uh, he uh, does both uh, abstract theoretical things and things that are very closely connected to data. Um, and as some of you know, I had the uh, pleasure of being one of his PhD advisors. So it's uh, nice to, one, one of the, the fun parts of being a professor is uh, watching people grow up. So Gaspar, please. All right. Well, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. I'm, I'm actually very happy this is taking place and it's taking place online, even though um, it would have been great to meet in person. Uh, so what, what I'm going to be talking about today is, um, is more on the focus of uh, in the focus of abstract models. So it's not making uh, really contact with data yet, although we hope this would happen. Um, and before I go on, I would like to acknowledge the work. So this was done by a grad student in our group, Rog Krach. And it's a very, very much a close collaboration with Ben Zoller, who is um, a postdoc working with Thomas Greger, uh, both Princeton and, and at Institute Pasteur. And I'm, I'm highlighting you know, Ben's involvement, also his theoretical contributions here or with the desire that at some point, the kind of models that we are uh, thinking about and I would be presenting today uh, would be sort of are shaped such that we, they could make contact with data and we hope we can make contact with data in this case, um, of course, um, in uh, studying transcription in, in, in Drosophila, which is what Thomas's lab is doing. <clears throat> so let me get started. Um, so this is the outline of the talk. I'll first uh, give very brief uh, introduction about gene regulation, uh, a few words about prokaryotes and then thinking about eukaryotes. This is because my entry into this was actually through learning about uh, models of, uh, of transcriptional regulation in prokaryotes. That's why, I'm, that's why that is my starting point. Uh, then I will try to say, um, describe briefly the approach we are, we are taking here. That is this normative approach, which you could call an optimization principle approach. Um, so I'll try to motivate this. I think it's a, it's a powerful it has been a powerful idea, but maybe we can make use of it to distill, uh, to tame the complexity of these complicated molecular processes that really focus on, on the descriptions that, um, that have a ch maybe a, a chance of working when we confront them with data. Um, the third part will be then this model of non-equilibrium uh, enhancer function that, that we study that I'll introduce and then try to kind of sharpen some, um, some connections to what, you know, to talk about experimental predictions, say how to sharpen this model for the application to real data. All right, so um, gene regulation, uh, as, as, as you know, uh, as you all know, involves a flow of information from DNA to R mRNA to protein. And in fact, it could be seen as sort of the simplest correction to this one way street where information goes from DNA to protein. That is, it, it introduces the loop where proteins, special regulatory proteins, can actually affect the way in which information is read out from the DNA and, and in, you know, kind of tran translated into, into the proteins. Um, so it's kind of the simplest, I mean, that's how I like to view it as a sort of modification of the central dogma of biology. And the principal means by which this feedback uh, arrow is, is achieved uh, is, is by this special class of, of, of proteins called the transcription factors that can, um, here they're, they're shown in, in, in this yellowish color, which schematically, of course, which can interact with uh, special sites on the DNA, uh, the binding sites, they can bind there and through the binding in, you know, which, of, of region, which typically are in the promoter uh, regions in prokaryotes, enhancer regions, in, 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 in eukaryotes also, uh, through the binding, they can then affect the rate at which um, uh, um, genes are, are transcribed. Um, now, this picture is, of course, very, very much simplified. 
Um, it is conceptually quite straightforward, but nevertheless, it actually inspired very successful quantitative models um, of transcriptional regulation for prokaryotes, right? And I think um, even though uh, the, 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 the paper I'm referencing here, so this is the work of uh, Bintu et al from the group. So there was a group, a large number of authors, including Yane, who was there and Rob Phillips and so on. So of course, this is not the first um, work to uh, talk about thermodynamic models of regulation, uh, but it is sort of this conceptually nice and systematic picture by which one can uh, write down, uh, uh, first of all, graphical schemes of how a repressor, let's say, acts on, uh, on, on the polymerase, how an activator might act, how com more and more complicated schemes might act. And to every one of such pictures, there corresponds uh, a, a mathematical model, which is a model where these molecular players, be it transcription factors or the, or the polymerase, bind in thermodynamic equilibrium to the DNA. And what is to be computed, which is what these expressions are, is the probability that polymerase sits on the correct spot on the DNA. And, and by assumption, that probability will be proportional to gene expression. So this is sort of a, um, you know, this kind of uh, scheme, for instance, a, a simple diagram that's shown here with a predicted exp you know, formula that, that specifies gene expression as a function of the concentration of the activators and so on. That can be made concrete um, and actually inferred from data. So here is a, a very nice work from uh, Justin Kinney um, and, and colleagues, and he has been continuing with this line of work where, for instance, you can, uh, using large uh, uh, libraries of, of promoter mutants, where this DNA sequence to which transcription factor and the polymerase binds, uh, by generating these libraries, you can infer extremely precise models of how a transcription factor recognizes uh, these various binding sites. And this model here is it's schematized by the energy matrix. Uh, this model predicts the interaction energy of the transcription factor to the DNA sequence for sort of any type of sequence um, or any type of mutant. Similarly, for RNAP, uh, you can infer the interaction energy uh, between the two, right? That stabilizes the binding because CRP is an activator. Um, and you can, you can make this schematic diagram very concrete and predictive, right? So this gives quantitative predictions. Um, you know, this has been extended, for instance, including also um, some of the work that we, where we have been involved in, where uh, you can not only predict, say, the expression level or the binding probability of polymerase to the sequence for a few mutants on top of the wild type sequence, but you can actually predict it. So here is the measured uh, gene expression, uh, so kind of fluorescence. So gene expression is, is driving a, a fluorescence reporter. So measured versus model prediction in, in an improved model of this RNAP DNA interaction that we worked on, uh, these are the uh, these orange dots, uh, where the orange dots are completely random sequences now. So not just mutations on top of some known strong promoter, but sort of random pieces of DNA that can or do not, they do or do not drive the expression. And so you can construct for bacteria slowly models that really generalize. So they take an arbitrary piece of sequence and predict from it the gene expression, okay? Which somehow, you know, tells us that we understand the mechanisms and the assumptions. There are exceptions, but in general, we understand the mechanisms, the language of how to describe this. And it's really a predictive language, right? So this sort of enterprise um, in the field has been, I think, a, a great success. And this success is really in a large part, thanks to the equilibrium assumption. That is the only thing that we need to know in these models are sort of binding energies and interaction energies between these molecules bound on the DNA. And this is a drastic simplification, right? We just, as you know, we just do statistical mechanics, which, which energies assigned to various binding configurations. So no complicated reaction schemes with a ton of reaction rates to understand most of it. And I said, there, there are known exceptions where maybe this doesn't work. <clears throat> um, also in terms of, how to say also in terms of how we analyze experimental data, equilibrium assumption uh, gives us relevant variables, right? We know that what we, 
what, what is to be extracted from data are these interaction energies. And once we know, you know, with DNA and the TF, and the TF and TF transcription factor, once we know these, then essentially we have, you know, we have solved the problem. So we, one knows what to look for, right? Um, <clears throat> or what to extract from the data. Uh, if you do this inference correctly, we really can infer things in absolute units. So you see here interaction energies, not just, you know, not things proportional to some unknown standard, but actually in KBT or KCAL per mole interaction energies or binding energies. So these are true energy matrices with entries that are energies, not just the bioinformatics type position weight matrices, but the true, uh, you know, physical quantities, right? And uh, there has been sort of different type of work, both in vivo as well as in vitro. There have been equilibrium measurements of, of the binding of these guys to DNA, as well as kinetic measurements, for instance, in the works of uh, Sebastian Mer Merkel and Steve Quake. And one can claim that both kinetic measurements um, and uh, equilibrium measurements and both in vivo and in vitro with care uh, measurements can actually be, can work, can be consistent. Right, um, you know, giving us faith in, in, in this thermodynamic equilibrium picture. And so if you draw the line, what we have here are really mechanistic models that are interpretable. Um, so we can draw them. It's very geometric what binds where, and they have really statistical predictive power also, right? As to what will be the expression from an unknown piece of sequence. So in that sense, this is, I think, quite a, quite a success with still space for improvement, but, but quite a success. Um, now, if you go from this prokaryotic picture to eukaryotic gene regulatory networks, um, I, I like to use this. It's already very old. This is sort of a uh, Davidson's kind of uh, engineering view of a patterning network or of a developmental network in a, uh, <coughs> in, in a sea urchin um, embryo, where it's sort of, you know, the network is represented by these um, uh, circles which integrate um, uh, input signals in order to determine whether some gene will be expressed or not. And this looks extremely clean, extremely complicated, right? Um, and very specific, right? That there is lines going in this little, into these little transistors. Um, but I think one has to have in mind and contrast this engineering like diagram with sort of a biophysical re reality that, that underlies it. And the biophysical reality, you know, one of the things here is that of course, these circles all represent molecular interactions, interactions between a transcription factor and DNA or protein and protein and so on. <clears throat> these interactions need to happen specifically. So it should be the, you know, the cognate transcription factor binding the correct site on the DNA, although it can also bind some other site. Um, and these cognate interactions, correct interactions, uh, you know, happen in a sea of other components that flow there that can also interact, but maybe, maybe not as strongly. Right. And so, first of all, you know, we have this problem that a lot of these molecular interactions happen at very low copy numbers, you know, sing, maybe even at a single molecule, right? In, if you think of a, of, of a promoter in a copy number of one or two. Um, so, these are really small molecular numbers interacting. And what we have is a lot of these molecular recognition interactions where the correct things have to come together. And so, uh, in our previous work, we have asked, um, you know, how can that, how can this even work if we need to have the correct reactions uh, that are preferred by very small um, sort of energy preference, maybe of, a, you know, measured in several KBTs, uh, how can that happen in the presence of a lot of incorrect possible binding reactions, uh, which are typically also in numerical excess? So it's sort of an energy, if you want, M energy versus chemical potential um, uh, type of, of, of dilemma. And in this previous work, we kind of put in some back of the envelope estimations for transcriptional regulation, right? For how do TFs, how can we ensure that transcription factors actually activate the correct genes? And we did some back of the envelope calculations and figure out that maybe the problem of, of, of ensuring this specificity, kind of reducing the wrong bindings um, is not so trivial for eukaryotes. And I'll come back to that just to motivate. Uh, <clears throat> So let me see where I'm. Uh, right. And then we have on top, of course, this combinatorial complexity, right? That to regulate the gene, it's not only one molecular interaction that's needed. You need a specific set of transcription factors, presumably present at correct concentrations for, for, for something to happen. Right. And so if you then zoom into one of these small circles that's supposed to uh, represent uh, eukaryotic uh, transcriptional control, um, you know, there is this sort of a, 
uh, uh, kind of a, a rich but also nightmarish for a theorist scenario of, of all the molecular players that are involved, right? So you have an enhanced region on the DNA, lots of different transcription factors interacting here, binding directly to the DNA, uh, and then they interact with all these um, uh, intermediate proteins, in this case, it's a sort of the mediator complex that then somehow you know, once bound and so on, interacts with the uh, pre-initiation complex in order to trigger the transcription. So in short, there is many molecular players' reactions, there is kinetic rates, there are lots of these things that, that, that include molecular, that include uh, uh, chemical modifications. So it, it's not equilibrium energy is being spent to, to put various markers on various molecules. And a lot of this, is known, but a lot is still unknown, right? And in particular, the sequencing of how you know these ev events proceed in order uh, is not completely clear. Uh, as said, some interactions are clearly out of equilibrium. The models suddenly, you know, before the models were very predictive, uh, quantitative. Here, the models are often very pictorial, right? We don't have absolute measurements. We kind of have, you know, these interacting parts diagram, right? Um, uh, sometimes at best. Um, and as I said, there is all sorts of mysteries, right, about how these interactions happen at the distance, um, how they involve or not phase separation, what are the relevant time scales and so on. So to my mind, this, this suggested to us that, you know, full mechanistic models of really writing down a set of chemical reactions for all these components are, are, are intractable, right? And so the question is, okay, if, if that's really intractable, also if you, I want to connect it to data, um, can we do something theoretical that, that, that tames this complexity, that reduces um, this complexity? All right, so uh, four, the, the two existing approaches um, that I would like to uh, highlight first uh, that people have taken uh, to, to model uh, eukaryotic uh, transcriptional control. Uh, so one approach is to continue with what was successful in prokaryotes. So with this um, line of thermodynamic models, uh, for instance, in the, in the work of Barak Cohen and Sarup Sinha and so on. Um, now here, you can talk about transcription factors, little green balls binding and, you know, with some binding energy, with some energy matrix and interacting with, with uh, you know, these balls, which represent the, the uh, transcription apparatus like polymerase and so on. You, you can try to do this and simply ask, can I make predictions about my data? But to actually get good predictions, you need to introduce into these models, which were very nicely theoretically based as thermodynamic models, equilibrium models, you, you suddenly need to start introducing all sorts of tweaks, which are actually no longer thermodynamically valid. Uh, you know, you, you start saying, well, you know, when the repressor binds at a certain site here, it kind of mysteriously extinguishes all the binding of all the activators in some domain, which is way bigger than you could maybe explain by steric occlusion. Let's just assume that happens, right? Um, and so if you introduce a number of such tweaks, then you can get statistical predictive performance. Uh, so you can predict the expression from say, you know, mut mutant sequences and so on. Um, but, you know, this is still um, in contrast with, with some other experimental observations that is slowly accumulating. So, for instance, there is uh, suggestions that uh, the order, the temporal order in which the molecules of TF arrive and, and, and bind might matter for gene activation. This clearly doesn't look like an equilibrium thing. Um, there is an observation that sometimes transcription factors interact with their sites very, very transiently. So they come, they interact, they go, and then something happens, right? So it's sort of a hit and run scheme of regulation. Um, and also sometimes <clears throat> these observations are very hard to, uh, these models are very hard to uh, reconcile with these crosstalk limits that I discussed. So you can explain what happens on this particular sequence in the experiment, but somehow it's very hard to exclude that your model wouldn't predict all sorts of weird expression from all sorts of, you know, weird other sequences in the genome where no such expression probably happens. Um, but, you know, it would in these models uh, or likely would. Um, so that's one class. So let's take what works in bacteria and try to, you know, tweak it. Um, the other is sort of a let's depart from the equilibrium picture and let's consider a much richer class of models of which there are many, but typically there's sort of non-equilibrium kinetic, kinetic models where, where rates are important. There is a lot of works by uh, 
or Alvaro Sanchez and uh, Angela De Pace and, and, and many others. Um, here, the problem is that if is this explosion of complexity, as soon as we start considering all possible reaction schemes between regulatory mo molecules and the DNA, um, you know, we have a, an explosion of architectures and parameters, and it's very difficult to understand anything systematically, right? Um, and so much more, it's then very hard to infer any of this from data because typically, you know, the, the, the number of parameters is, is way more than, 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 than we can constrain unless we somehow drastically simplify. And the question is how? All right, so, you know, this was by, by, by means of introduction. Um, so maybe let me, let me outline now how we thought of applying this, what I, what I call the normative approach um, or, or an, uh, this kind of optimization type approach uh, to this problem of what kind of model class should we actually be considering. <clears throat> um, and, you know, this is still part of, 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 of an intro. So, you know, I, I'm trying to make the case here that um, normative approach, which means that you postulate some optimality um, and, and derive what should be happening if the optimality is true, this has really been central uh, for us to deal with biological complexity. And there is many examples of that. And perhaps the, perhaps the, the major one is evolution itself, where, you, where one tries to understand um, what is happening in the space of genomes, in the space of genotypes, by postulating that each genotype uh, maps into a certain reproductive value, into certain fitness, and that what evolutionary adaptation is doing is to maximize this fitness, right? And so if you have, of course, uh, and that is the big if, if you had a model that can map uh, genotypes, maybe some restricted set of genotypes to fitnesses, you could sort of derive what are the fittest um, uh, what are the fittest traits, what are the fittest organisms, what are their properties, and then you can perhaps, you know, compare this to, you know, to, to evolved uh, species or to, you know, some uh, lab evolution experiment, right? Now, you know, sometimes we cannot do that because we lack this mapping from, from genotype to fitness, but this thinking paradigm can be used as a proxy for other problems. Right? So you can think of something more molecular, like a metabolic network um, of E. coli with all the reactions. Um, and we know the, the list of reactions. And so you could say, well, uh, the fluxes through these reactions um, are such that, or you know, have been evolved to be such that the um, growth flux, which is the production of new cell from old, is maximized because that leads to higher growth and that leads to higher fitness. And that gives you a prediction of what should be the fluxes through metabolic um, uh, pathways, which you can try to measure, right? And so this is a well-known uh, flux balance analysis type approach to, to, to metabolic networks. You might have uh, <clears throat> sort of somewhat crazy scenarios such as how do organisms build their transport networks and you can write down optimality criteria for, for efficient transport and then try to kind of derive or explain why is it that a certain transport scheme has been designed um, and, and so on and so forth. Of course, this is very much at home in neuroscience um, as well, where we postulate that information is being transmitted from natural signals into, um, say, into, in the, in, through the sensory system into the central brain. And there is also the work that we have done where information flow is maximized in transcriptional regulation. Um, so lots of examples. Um, and you know, before I go on, I would like to use this um, uh, uh, top-down normative theory and compare it with the way we typically do um, bottom-up mod or mod data-driven model inference, right? So, um, you know, in, in, in this normal optimization line of thinking, the goal is let's find the model and its parameters that optimizes some biological function. And so this is really is the, the, what we will find is driven by saying what this function is. We can write it down mathematically and optimize it. This makes no contact with data, right? So this is ab initio prediction. Um, so we start with some utility function and with some model. And then what you're doing uh, is you're trying to, um, you know, go from this given utility function and find the optimal set of parameters that, that you know, realize the, the, the best function. Okay, so this would be a normative, uh, normative approach, let's say you find the fluxes that maximize the growth rate in metabolic networks. 
Now contrast that with sort of bottom-up model inference, uh, statistical inference, right? We want to this there we we start with some data, some actual measurement, and we want to find the model that best fits the data. So we start with D and with the model, and then what we we again identify a set of parameters, but this set of parameters doesn't optimally yield the function, it optimally describes the data. So we say we maximize the likelihood, let's say when we do the fitting, right? And typically this two approaches have been used independently. So you either started with some normative principle and derive the property of the system and then maybe compare to data, or you postulated the model class, take the data, infer the model. And maybe then you said, does it do something well or not? But you know, you did either the, 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 the blue or you did the red. Um, now, in, in some recent work, we suggested that actually there is, you know, that there is a very productive um, uh, uh, way to combine these two approaches uh, that in, in, a, in a sense that's also statistically rigorous. So optimization principle, right, gives me a prediction in the space of model parameters. It said, here is the best system, right, that, that optimally carries out some function. Um, inference gives me the best set of parameters that describes my data. So the question is, can you, you know, is there something where, let's say, is there a, a line of thinking where the optimization theory suggests you these, these, in, with this set of, like in this class of models or in this part of the parameter space, there would be solutions that carry out the function well, and that restricts the complexity a lot. And then you use the data only to find the model within that class. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the line of, of, of thinking that we will try to, to take. If you're more interested about the statistical framework, um, then you, you might be uh, interested in consulting this reference. Okay, so how do we do this concretely for our enhancer um, uh, models, right? So we'll, we'll proceed in the following steps. We'll first try to identify a, a model class that's rich enough that it can encompass both transcriptional regulation in equilibrium and out of equilibrium. It's not arbitrarily large, it's still restricted, but it can do these two things at once. Then we will define regulatory phenotypes that are, these are observables or desired properties of the regulatory uh, mechanism. I'll, I'll introduce them. <clears throat> and then we, we, we will try to identify within this model class that part of parameter space which, uh, which in which these regulatory phenotypes give us a desired function. Let's say they give us um, you know, very good specificity of regulation or low noise in gene expression, right? So things that we believe are beneficial to, to the regulatory process, uh, right? So this is this, you know? so we will we, identify the regulatory phenotypes and then we'll find the operating regime of this model that supports this, uh, this, this optimal regulatory function. And now, so this, the, the red stuff is normative. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. This would give us a model class and the parameter regime that's good. And then a subsequent step, the blue step, would then be to, you know, to take, to take that knowledge, to take that simplification and try to infer the exact values of parameters from data. And this we haven't done yet, so I cannot report on that yet. We are doing the first steps with, with data, right? So this is the topic of today's talk. And then the point number four should come later. All right, so this inference. All right, so maybe it's a good, I mean, so now, I'll start introducing them all. I don't know if it's a good point, if somebody has any, any questions. I cannot see the chat. So, um, Bill, can you check what was, was there? So far, there are no questions. So far, no? OK. I mean, um, it's let, maybe this is a, a moment to remind everyone that you should uh, put questions into the chat. And I guess, Gaspar, you'll pause, uh, maybe pause after this section, and we'll see how people Exactly, yeah. I, I, I'm going to do that. I mean, I think I'll finish before my time. So there also should be questions at, at, at the, you know, time for questions at the end as well. But I'll pause after, after the next block. All right. So after this long introduction, let me let me move now to um, to the to the kind of model we we, we have been considering. Um, let me first say that this will be so. This we are we were looking for actually the one of the simplest kinds of generalization of equilibrium models. So like, what is the 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 simplest way of going away from kind of prokaryotic equilibrium models? but such that it would expand the range of what this model can explain, right? Um, we wanted to do this, we wanted to keep this simplicity 
both to understand stuff analytically, but also because uh, faced with data, we wanted to be able to infer all the parameters ultimately, right, of, of such a model. All right, so here is a here is a reaction scheme. Let me explain what this is. It's a bit simple. The plotting is a bit simplified. So this this line here represents um, a, a binding site for a transcription factor. I can think of more such binding sites. We just don't plot them. So there could be multiple transcription factors, let's say binding in, in an enhancer. And this binding site can be either occupied, which is the this, this uh, greenish ball or, or empty when it is gray. So this is when transcription factor is bound or, or is not bound. <clears throat> so let me, let me put this on. So these transcription factors can either bind or unbind from these binding sites. And I said, you know, this generalizes to n binding sites. They can all be different and so on. It's just more com computationally painful. Um, and so you have, you know, you, you have, I haven't said anything about this weird blob yet, but transcription factor bound and unbound, um, uh, you can transition between these two states with some, uh, with some uh, uh, intrinsic rate. So the K plus is the rate for binding of the transcription factor that we think as being proportional to the concentration of, of that transcription factor. Um, and then the transcription factor can also, once it's bound, it can also unbind at some rate K minus. This K minus, the off rate, is dependent on the sequence of this binding site. So if you think of uh, TF being bound to its cognate site, to its preferred sequence, this K minus will be low, right? So the unbinding rate will be slow. If this is bound to some arbitrary random piece of DNA, some non-specific thing, it will, the TF will fall off much faster. So the K minus would be higher in that case. So this binding and unbinding is one sort of molecular event that can happen here. <clears throat> um, now there is this blob that you see plotted that sometimes says on and sometimes says off. So that in our super simplified world is, um, is what we call the mediator complex, it, but it is essentially um, an abstraction for, 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 for um, uh, sort of all of the proteinaceous partners of the transcription factors that are necessary to, um, uh, uh, to, to activate uh, the transcription that may interact with the transcription factor. So this could be a complex of many more proteins. But the simplification we make here is that this, this complex can be in two functional states. I mean, molecular states, there could be more, but there is two functional states that we call on and off, where on is condu conducive to transcription um, and, and off is not, right? And you could think, of course, in a, in a, in a molecularly more detailed scenario, maybe you could think of, 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 of transcription factors bound and, and, and this mediator being on as, as, you know, the whole mediator complex that it, when it interacts with, with the promoter and so on, uh, right, it can trigger a transcription, a transcription step. Um, so, you know, here there is sort of rates of switching of this or this this, this complex, is, which I call media, can switch between on and off states with some intrinsic rates, kappa minus and kappa plus, right? So this is still quite, quite um, straightforward. Now, I think the interesting thing is that uh, what, we, what we postulated is that there can be a, a molecular event which links, this is what we saw with some rate K link, which links a bound transcription factor to the mediator. Um, now we, you know, in, in this case, we do not specify molecularly what this link, what this could be, right? Whether it is sort of a molecular modification or anything. It's just sort of a, a, a reaction step in which um, the, the complex and the bound TF can establish this sort of interaction, which I denote by, by the red, uh, by this red line, and I call a link, okay? And what is important is that once linked, this link is now stabilizing two things in the model. So it's, first of all, it stabilizes the rate at which the transcription factor dissociates uh, from the binding side, right? So this rate is normally K minus, but when the, when, when the link is present, it's K minus divided by a factor alpha, which is, an, you know, for now it's a parameter. But it also stabilizes the rate at which the mediator can switch from on to off state. Right, and so again, this rate without the link would be kappa minus, which is this thing. But now it's kappa minus divided by alpha. Right, <clears throat> so you know, we you you can make you can make this more complicated. I mean, in the simplest case, one just assumes that whenever the mediator switches um, 
off or the TF dissociates, the link goes away. Yeah? Um, and so why, do, you know, why did we choose this particular simple model, right? Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to first decouple the direct connection between the expression, which happens when the mediator is on and off, and transcription factor presence or absence. Okay, so TFs can come and go, they can bind and unbind, uh, right? And they, that doesn't immediately affect trans transcription, it only affects it through affecting the state of this mediator um, complex, right? Uh, and second of all, uh, the, the way this is, this is structured, the creation of these links um, introduce sort of a, a non-equilibrium type um, event into this reaction scheme. As you see, sort of there is no direct kind of, you know, transition going backwards, right, um, uh, here, but, I mean, by assumption, right? Um, and third, if you think about this particular scheme, um, it does require some thought if you haven't done this before. Th this scheme permits, um, uh, permits uh, kinetic proofreading a la, um, Hop, you know, a la Hopfield um, uh, scheme, right? Um, and in order to see that, one would have to consider what happens when, uh, if, a, a, if a transcription factor um, comes and binds to the correct site, to the correct regulatory region, um, or if it comes and binds to an incorrect non-specific regulatory region, right? If it comes to uh, the correct site and it binds there, then because it has a high affinity, it will stay there for some time. If it stays there for some time, the link will be created with certain probability with the scaling rate. Um, and, you know, that will sort of, you know, that's kind of a non-equilibrium style, that's sort of a confirmation. Yes, you were, you were on the site for long enough and you stay on the site then even when, 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 this is, when, when, when the link, link is established. Whereas if the transcription factor is interacting with sort of a, a, a non-specific site, it can, but as soon as it binds, nothing happens yet. Transcription doesn't happen yet, right? Because a link has to be created first, uh, but this gives the transcription factor enough time to sort of fall down from the wrong side and therefore no transcription would happen from such a spurious site, right? So, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to that, but, but that was our, you know, those were our motivations for studying this scheme. Now, an interesting property of this scheme is that when this reaction rate, this scaling here uh, gets to be very fast or, you know, in the limit where it's, where, where it's infinite, right? There can be no longer a distinction between this state without the link and this state with the link. So basically you get this particular scheme, right? Of a, <clears throat> of a, 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 of a mediator that can switch between two states on and off um, and that switching is influenced by the presence or absence of you know, this transcription factor, which you can view as a ligand. And you can recognize in, in such a scheme, even if you put more transcription factors here, um, a, a, a famous mono weinmann changeau type model for which you can immediately write down the probability that the mediator will be in, uh, in an on state, right? So you can express that probability that's how an equilibrium model. Uh, <clears throat> and you can identify uh, these various rates, uh, for instance, the kappa plus and kappa minus, which are the which is the intrinsic switching rate uh, of the mediator between on and off, you can identify it as this L parameter, which is the mono one mentioned show bias or free energy bias to be on and off, even if there is no transcription factor, no ligand bound, <coughs> and uh, sort of. The, the rates of TF going on and off can be identified as the, with the epsilon, with the binding energy of the ligand uh, to its site. And this alpha, this stabilization factor, when you have a link, can be identified with the uh, sort of, an, you know, it has, has an equivalent effect to, you know, to, to kind of a stabilization, you know, to the energy difference of, you know, being bound when active and inactive. Um, and similarly, actually, a similar construction is possible for thermodynamic, and I'm not showing that, for thermodynamic models of regulation where you have, let's say, two binding sites and two transcription factors bind, and they can bind cooperatively. If they're both there, you get the co cooperative energy in a thermodynamic equilibrium model. You can think of that model also as a limit of a non-equilibrium model where you have two TFs coming there, and then at some rate, the link between them can be established, right? Um, so you, you can carry through this, this weird reasoning where you think you, you start with an equilibrium model and you make it non-equilibrium in one very particular direction as here by introducing this finite k-link. Uh, 
Um, all right, so, so the bottom line here is that um, we can, we design a, 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 a class of models that has essentially one extra parameter compared to its equilibrium limit, which is the fact that the scaling, the linking rate is, is, is finite, is not infinite. Um, in the limit where this rate goes to infinity, we recover a very well-known and studied equilibrium model. And we, and you know, the suspicion why we introduced it was that it has some beneficial properties, right? That we'll talk about, including kinetic proofreading. So now we want to ask what are the behaviors um, of these new uh, model class? Okay, and so remember the plan, I introduced the model. Now I'll talk about regulatory phenotypes. So what are the kind of variables? What do we want this transcriptional model to achieve? Um, so let me introduce a few. Maybe before yep. you go on, this is a, there's a couple of questions about the structure yep. of the model itself. Okay. So, okay. Um, Can you, one, would you be so yeah, kind one, to? Yeah, one very specific one is you said that K minus is sequence dependent, but K plus presumably is not. So maybe you want mm -hmm. to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, so I so, so this was the sim this was the simplest thing that that uh, that we assumed, and it, it's it's sort of based on the intuition that the k plus is let's say simply a diffusion limited rate by which a transcription factor arrives at, at the binding site, and so it's sort of sequence independent. It's basically just dependent on the transport mechanism. In in this simple case, let's say it could be diffusion, and then k minus sort of the off rate. Um, you know, as, as is known and as this has been experimentally measured for, for, for transcription factors, um, that is sort of a, um, a, a sequence dependent step, right? Because you are, you have this stable, stable bound configuration on the, on the DNA and how you interact with the DNA by, you know, making all the um, um, uh, contacts between amino acids and the, and, and, and the DNA, that determines the rate at which you fall off. So, I don't think it's sort of, it's not an unusual, I would say, starting point. So the other question was whether you've thought about having a more, a more starting from a more microscopic non-equilibrium model and coarse graining to get to. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's, so we have thought about it and we haven't done it mainly because um, I would have preferred that, um, but uh, but I am just personally at least at the loss of what like what microscopic model to even start with, um, because I, I cannot you know I, I can look at the molecular um, players involved, but I still don't know enough to actually formulate that more detailed model even because I, I at least I think we have not accumulated enough knowledge to do it. So we had to start. So we decided to start at this very functional level. Right, very abstract level, which is not a proper coarse graining. Okay, everybody, everybody, all right. Good, please go on. All right. Um, so, just a second. Okay, so, so I was talking about molecular phenotypes, um, and so the things we would like to compute in our model, uh, because they either are constrained by experimental data, at least within some range, or we think they should be extremized by evolution. Uh, so first of all, it's the typical transcription factor residence time. So this is the, you know, when, uh, TA, when, when in a functioning enhancer, let's say of a, of a model I was, uh, of the type I was describing, when the TFs are there and bound, what's the typical time they stay on the, on the DNA? Now I said the isolated rate of the TF falling off is K minus, okay, in my notation. However, if you have multiple of these TFs there and the mediator and they can be linked and the links are stabilizing the, the residence time, right? of course, then the effective residence time is, is now a property of the whole model that you have to compute, right? And it depends on other, you know, on other parameters. So we would like, uh, we would like to have the capability of achieving good regulation. I'll say what that means even when TFs individually on average are not stuck at the binding sites for a very long time. And this is because, you know, there have been reports and measurements, single molecule measurements of, of, re of such residence times, which can be as short as on cognate sites, which can be as short as seconds, right, for, for eukaryotes. So pro for prokaryotes, it's known as some tr transcription factors can really stick on the binding sites for a very, you know, very long time. But this is not clear, clearly the case for... Uh, for eukaryotic transcription. That's, that's the first thing we'll compute. The second is very simple. We just want to compute um, what is the average 
expression, which in our case is the probability of mediator complex being on from cognate enhancers, that is from enhancers that whose binding sites are these specific, you know, specific binding sites, right? Where, where the thing binds specifically. And, you know, we just generally want this at, at, the, at the given concentration level that we'll consider to be high enough, right? So that you can express, you know, you can express from a cognate enhancer with some high probability, whereas it's like, you know, order one, right? Let's say 0 0.5. <clears throat> the, the third thing that we'll take into account is that the specificity of individual transcription factors is constrained, which means that if you look at one TF, typically recognizing a very short motif in eukaryotes, maybe six, eight base pairs, right? And you ask, how strongly does such a TF in isolation bind to its cognate binding site versus how strongly does it bind to a random piece of sequence? So how long, you know, it stays on one versus on the other. So this is if you want the K minus from the cognate DNA uh, uh, binding site and K minus from some random piece. These two off rates and this specificity is not that great for eukaryotic transcription. So it's reported to be essentially uh, you know, only two to three orders of magnitude apart. That's actually for a single TF. That's much slower, uh, that's much less than say um, prokaryotic TFs that recognize much longer sequences and, and therefore can discriminate uh, cognate and non-cognate sites um, uh, much better, All right? <clears throat> um, so, where are so, so if you imagine now, um, you know, plotting here um, for, for such a model as a function of transcription factor concentration um, expression that you could compute from the, from the kind of model that I, that I introduce if you have all the parameters. If you imagine computing the expression as a function of concentration, well then the higher the concentration uh, of TF, the, you know, the higher the expression from the cognate side. But actually, similarly, this will happen if you ask what would this model predict on a random piece of sequence, right? Obviously, once you make the concentration of TF high enough, it will bind, the TFs will also bind to some sort of, you know, random piece of sequence, uh, of course, at much higher concentrations. And, and, and there you would also predict um, uh, some expression typically, right? Um, which would be kind of crosstalk, wrong expression, right? From non-cognate sequence. Now, if you, we define um, the ratio of the expression uh, from the cognate binding sites uh, to the expression from the non-cognate binding sites, we call this specificity S, right? And that, as you see here, will also have a peak as a function of, of, of the concentration. We will want this in the operating regime of our model to be high. We will want our models to express when they are when the TFs bind to the cognate binding sites, but to not express from sort of other types of sequence that um, that are that do not contain the cognate binding sites. So this is this desire to minimize uh, to to maximize correct function while also minimizing uh, you know the function that should not be there, right? Sort of expression from a random piece of sequence or some junk DNA. And then the sensitivity uh, will be the steepness. It's defined as if you want the slope of the induction curve um, here, right? Now, why do we why do we define these regulatory phenotypes? Well, because there is typical constraints on uh, what this should be. So, we, as I said, for uh, residence times of transcriptions on specific binding sites, we have you know pretty broad, but we have some estimates. Uh, we we you know we there is estimates on how. Uh, you know, how frequently are enhancers active um, or how frequently transcription happens, I should say. We have estimates, um, at least the, the, the range of, of, of these uh, sensitivities of the steepnesses of the induction curve. Um, for specificity, uh, we don't know. I mean, the, this has received actually less attention in, in, for the specificity defined as, as we define it. But here we will assume that we want specificity that is as high as possible given our other constraints. So this will be sort of an optimization part. And then the last thing that we'll consider is also noise in gene expression. So, so these models where transcription uh, depends on the state of our mediator on off switching, uh, which is stochastic, these models generate some noise in gene expression because of this stochastic switching. And we would want that this noise to be as low as possible, right? So these are the things which we want to sort of extremize in, in, in our model. Okay, so now if you take that reaction scheme 
it simplified, it only had one binding site, we can do it for n binding sites, you know, with the mediator and all the rates and so on. Uh, if you take that model, you can describe it fully by a chemical master equation. That equation can be solved numerically for the state spaces we talk about. You can actually solve it, not just stochastically simulate it, or you can simulate it with the stochastic simulation algorithm. And so for any choice of these parameters, the you know k, k, kappa plus, kappa minus, off rate, on rate, and concentration of TFs, and so on, we can compute all these regulatory phenotypes, right? So for any choice of parameters, we can compute these regulatory phenotypes. And so um, what I'm going to show you here is the result of such computations within this class of models. So we, we consider here a model that has three binding sites, all symmetric, so to make it simple. So there is three binding sites for transcription factors and then this sort of mediator complex. And you can exhaustively you know, explore this model space as a function of, it, of its parameters. In particular, this stabilization parameter alpha. So alpha is the thing that tells you if a link is established, how, you know, how, how much longer do TFs remain on their sides and how much longer mediator stays on. Um, and that this rate of establishing a link, K, K link. So what is shown here is sort of a kind of a phase diagram. Uh, one regulatory phenotype is on the x-axis. That is the transcription factor residence time, typical sort of average residence time of TFs. Um, it's normalized such that one means that, you know, this is what a TF would spend on a specific site in isolation without any other TS, without a mediator, right? Um, and then S is, is this specificity quantity, right? So specificity is how, what is, um, what is the relative rate between being active on cognate enhancer, on true sequence, that the matching sequence versus, you know, expressing by chance from some random random junk sequence that you should not express from. So how, how you know, with what likelihood do you reject the wrong sequences and accept the correct one? So this is this S factor here. And if I, ch so this is a, the, a, the fixed concentration of transcription factor. I can vary the parameters of my model. And if I vary all the parameters of my model, um, the behaviors that are allowed uh, exist in this colored domain here. So all the models have, you know, that you can access happen in this colored domain. You know, there is limits that, that are simple to compute. Um, as I make this stabilization factor alpha higher and higher, I move towards the right. So stabilization means when TF is, is bound um, and link is established, how much, you know, how much less likely is for the TF to fall off? Of course, this means as alpha increases, I go toward the right. The residence time of transcription factors gets larger and larger. But what you also see is that all the models collapse down onto a specificity of if one, right? Which means this is a very bad limit we, where specificity vanishes. And this is because, you know, he, if alpha goes to infinity uh, or to very, very large values, uh, once you bind and make the link, irrespective of whether you bound on the correct sequence or wrong sequence, you're just stuck there forever, right? So you cannot reject wrong sequences, basically. Right? So specificity in this limit vanishes is not an interesting, it's kind of non, not an interesting non-functional regulation limit. Now the other limit, when you make the K link high, the you know the linking rate high between the TF and, and the mediator, that's interesting. This limit is um, the red manifold, the red line here. This is the equilibrium limit. We said in this, in when K link gets to be infinity, we reduce back to the equilibrium mono one man Shanjo type model, and that model is on this red line here, right? So some of these models are obviously here; they're functional. Um, they have different uh, residence times for the TFs, and they also achieve some specificity that you see here, right? Uh, going up to maybe the highest specificity, which is denoted in the equilibrium limit, which is denoted by this one. Now, what's interesting is that, um, uh, so this, you know, red line is limit, uh, K, K, lim, K uh, link being infinity, but if you want to move up, right, from the red line, then these are models that have a finite intermediate K link. And you can see that that is beneficial, right? You can move from an equilibrium model here to a non-equilibrium model, which is this guy here, increasing essentially specificity by at least an order, almost two orders of magnitude, right? But still keeping the same residence time 
of the transcription factors, right? Um, so this means that you can maximize one of our uh, regulatory phenotypes, in this case, specificity, uh, by departing from the equilibrium class of models and going you know, upwards in this diagram. Now, um, what we did next, which, which, I find in, which I found interesting, is that we select these two models for comparison. They have a matching TF residence time, but they're different in specificity. We took these two, and then for these two, these are the Roman one and two, we plotted their induction curves. You know, like in a typical induction, so we take the model, you vary the concentration of TF, and you ask what would be the expression from a cognate binding site for the model one and the model two. And this is in dark, right? Um, and what you, what you conclude is that essentially you could not tell really the difference between these two models by just looking at the at, at, at expression curves or induction curves. We did more exploration, whether there is like some fine signatures in the shape of these curves and so on. And it would be very hard if this is an experimental measurement of an induction curve, which you can easily, easily measure, it would be very hard to say whether this is an equilibrium, non-equilibrium model or, or, or whatnot. But it is more, in, more interesting when you look at what these two, how these two models respond when they are asked for, to predict expression from random piece of DNA, from, from, from DNA that does not have cognate sites, but it has sites with very much higher off rates, K minus. And in this case, as you would expect, the equilibrium model, this is Roman one, you know, it, it of course, in this, in this concentration range, it will induce from the, from the cognate side and not from the non-cognate side. But if you force it with higher and higher TF concentration, of course, it, it will yield. It will also express from any random piece of sequence, right? Because it's high enough concentration, things will bind and, and you know, they will establish uh, all the links and you, you, will, you will trigger expression. And this is where the model two, the non-equilibrium model actually gains, right? Because, and this is sort of a signature of its ability to do the proofreading, right? Uh, because it has this non-equilibrium step, it can actually reject fairly sophistic in a fairly sophisticated way expression from non-cognate wrong sequence, right? So this does not saturate at, at top expression. So expression from non-cognate sequence does not saturate. It can be kept low, right? Because this proofreading is operational. Um, this is this is interesting. Uh, if you want to think of experimental signatures of whether such non-equilibrium thing is in progress, this means actually don't worry about induction curves and e expression measurements from known strong binding sites in the true enhancers, right? Try to destroy these sites to move away to much more non-specific binding and maybe over-express transcription factors and see whether the transcription machinery can reject expressing from those destroyed enhancers or not, right? Uh, and if it's an equilibrium process without proofreading, at some point you'll express something, um, but but not if you have some some mechanism like this that that's that's operational. Um, so a word about sensitivity, uh, which I think also will make some interesting observation. So again, we have uh, that's again sort of a similar sort of phase diagram. So here we have um, a res typical residence time of a transcription factor that you can again control by changing alpha and, and k link. Um, and on this axis now uh, is the the effective Hill coefficient, so the steepness, steepness of the induction curve. And this is now plotted for uh, enhancer models that have two binding sites and three binding sites at different colors, right up to five. And uh, these lines are thick because th these are the manifolds of model of what can be accessed by varying various parameters, alpha, k-ling, and so on. And they still, all the models kind of collapse on this, you know, I mean, this one is thick, but relatively thin, thin manifolds. What you can see here is that, let me see, uh, as you make, again, as you make the stabilization factor alpha higher and higher, Right, then you get more and more cooperative. So, in the sense that if you have Hill coefficient goes up, if you have two binding sites, you will saturate with Hill coefficient of two. If you have five, you will saturate at five. Right, so that's not surprising. If you make things really, you know, cooperative and, and, and linking up into establishing a stable complex, really stable complexes, then your uh, Hill coefficient will approach the number of binding sites. However, Remember that that was actually a pretty shitty regime of regulation. This is where specificity is lost. And specificity was, um, let me find, yeah, the specificity was actually highest um, where, where alpha was not in the limit of very strong. It was somewhere in here, in between, 
And that's, that's interesting because if you want to maximize specificity, that actually predicts that your um, uh, observed Hill coefficient will not be equal to the number of, of, of binding sites, but it's actually rather about a half, I mean, it's now empirical, right? So you have to compute and so on, but it's actually rather a half of the number of binding sites. And so, you know, an, in a simple enhancer model, let's say it has five binding sites, if it were optimized for specificity, then its Hill coefficient or sensitivity would be, you know, two and a half somewhere thereabouts. Not, it would not, you know, it would not be five. And I'm saying this because quite a lot of theoretical work before has focused on um, on generating really sharp induction curves. It was sort of identifying good um, uh, operation with the sharpness of this of this transition, which, which could you know could be the case for certain biological purposes, but it does not go hand in hand with high with high uh, uh, with high specificity. So highest sensitivity is not necessarily also highest specificity in, in, in this class of models. Okay, and then the last thing I would like to, um, uh, to, to illustrate here is another interesting thing, uh, which is if we talk about noise now. Um, so if you consider our model uh, of a mediator that can switch between on and off state, and this is affected by the binding of transcription factors, um, in some steady state, uh, these transitions on and off of the mediator will be stochastic. So there will be some stochastic switching and, and, and you know, it's kind of a binary variable on off variable. And so it will have a certain binomial variance, right? Which is uh, uh, kind of a E times one minus C, right? So E is the expression probability between zero, zero and one. So it's like a P times one minus P, like a binomial variance. Um, and this switching, the stochastic switching will happen at some time scale, right? And that time scale depends on the kinetic rates of our model. Um, <clears throat> now, this means that if you imagine this on and off switching of the mediator uh, is then connected with activating uh, transcription, which then leads to a protein, right? Uh, this stochastic switching will generate some variance in the protein copy number, which is what we call gene expression noise, right? Also in steady state. So typically, we take that noise to be, you know, bad because it limits the precision of, uh, of control. And so for us, the thinking was, you know, what, like what influences this noise? What kind of parameter space makes that noise as, be as small as possible, right? And so what we, what we looked at here, it's again, it's the same type of, a, you know, phase diagram that we've been looking at. So, but, but the, 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 what we plot on the axis are different quantities. So what we, what we plot here is, again, we explore the space of uh, models. Let's focus just on this column. This is where my enhanced, my, ex, my probability of, sorry, my expression from cognate sequence in the model is ha about a half. Right, so cognate, cognate, cognate enhancer strongly expresses. And then what I plot again on, on y axis is this specificity. Um, and on x axis is what is called the propagated noise fraction. So this, is, this means how much of this mediator switching variance actually filters through to the noise and protein expression, where zero means that uh, the, the mediator is switching so quickly between an on and off state that the long averaging time scale of the protein can just average that variance away completely. That's good because then protein noise goes to zero. So this is here. Um, but if the mediator switches very, very slowly, right, then most of these variance, you know, as slowly as the protein, let's say lifetime, decay time, then most of these vari switching variants would transmit into a variance in, 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 gene in, in protein level. And that would be here at this other end, which means high noise in, in the protein. So this is low noise, this is high noise, and this is specificity. And when I, when I tweak, when I scan what kind of the parameter space I can reach with my models, this is the kind of manifold that I can reach, as you see. Equilibrium is here, so it has low specificity, but also, um, so there, one of the equilibrium models is here, which re reaches, reaches low specificity, but also quite low noise. Okay, and the point is that I can, you know, I can find models that have a substantial improvement in specificity, and this is the log scale, at almost no increase in noise, right? So that I just move a little bit toward the right. But if I want to find sort of 
models that have an optimal um, specificity, the max, maximum specificity achievable, then I've moved all the way here where a noise is, you know, all the noise from mediator switching goes into the protein, right? And this is sort of a, in this model class, it is very generic. Um, I mean, I'm not showing all the exploration, but what basically happens is this proofreading capability that increases your specificity necessarily brings you the trade-off that the dynamics is slowing down, the dynamics of mediators we on off switching is, is slowing down and thus the noise in gene expression is going up, right? So this trade-off in the model class here is very robust. And an interesting question for future work is that if, you know, if this trade-off is really generic, even in a much broader class of models, right? This sort of noise versus um, uh, specificity trade-off. All right, so this is a, before I go into the last part of the talk, maybe if there is any open questions, um, that would be a good, good time. So there was one question about um, sort of what, what you think is the, the origin of the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes where, where you have the long residence times of the transcription factors in the prokaryotic case, but not. Mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. not so, so I, I mean, Obviously, that's a question that invites speculation, right? So I, I don't know the answer, obviously. But the, you know, the, the one thing that I could offer, and it, it, did, it, it did make me think, is that uh, in a very different line of research, we, uh, we have done by now quite a lot of work in asking how do these regulatory sequences actually evolve? And what are the evolutionary constraints um, on, the, you know, on the evolution of the binding sites? Um, and uh, you know, one thing that, that comes out from that work, which is all about you know, uh, kind of evolutionary dynamics, meaning strength of selection, population size, and so on, you know, trying to find good, good regulatory sequences, meaning, you know, the sequences that bind strongly, is that um, evolving very long or long binding sites is actually very difficult. And you need to have a high, you know, product of population size and selection coefficient. So it could be that in bacterial populations, you can simply afford evolutionarily to find, evolution can find fit, fit regulatory sequences that are say 15 base pairs long for transcription factors, which ensures automatically very high specificity. And in prokaryotes, uh, sorry, in eukaryotes, uh, you basically, you know, it's much harder to evolve these long sequences. It's easier to evolve many shorter sequences that have some degree of freedom in how they're positioned and so on. But then you need an apparatus coming on top of that that can integrate all of these weak binding signals while not, you know, while rejecting the wrong binding. So it could be that this, you know, one thing that I find amusing is to think that what has evolved is actually connected with what can evolve given the population genetic regimes in which bacteria or you know prokaryotes or eukaryotes find themselves but it's a speculation so another question is whether the the switching between on and off has to be mediator or whether you can think about it as switching in chromatin states or i for that matter I, it's something else exactly i i, I mean i I think in, 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 given how abstract our model is, you know, it, it, there is nothing that's specifically mediator like there. We, we call it that, that way, we put it in quotation marks so that we have a word for it. But I think it could be uh, any other mechanism, right? That, that, that has this conducive and non-conducive state, um, but it has to couple in the right way to the transcription factors, right? I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the only part where its identity is important. Um, all right. Okay, so I have. So I was. I was. Yep. Also, I actually have one question, which is, um, in thinking about the trade-off between specificity and noise levels, mm -hmm. you try to think about um, uh, if you try to think about transmitting information in an environment where you have many alternative binding sites, right? So I'm, I'm modulating. I'm, I'm modulating the concentration of many transcription factors which have many targets, and I try to ask how much information flows through that system, then both the noise and the specificity will contribute. Exactly, yeah. So um, there, there, is, there is a way of measuring them against each other. Yes, yes. I think we have done, 
we have done some baby steps in a separate publication that's or that but that was out of you know in a, in a toy model that was way too much of a toy model uh, with one site uh, but kind of going for this question um what i think what you're saying is that so right now what we did is we made a list of um of of understandable and possibly measurable uh, phenotypes. And we said, you know, this we want to minimize, this one we want to maximize, this one we want to constrain. But actually many of these can be subsumed into sort of a single utility function, right? I mean, you could write, as you say, information, if you write down something information theoretic, it will e e automatically include um, the trade-off between the noise and specificity, for instance, right? And then you could just optimize that one. Uh, so we have, we, we thought about this, we haven't done it. Um, but, you know, I think it would be a nice continuation. And um, sorry, just to finish off in, in your response to the question about chromatin states, uh, someone asked, wouldn't switching chromatin between on and off change transcription vector binding rates as well? I, I think that's the whole point, right? Is that, yeah, that yeah. I, I think, yes. So it, it that's right. It, I think it would. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So this is the you know this this is nearing the end. Uh, so what we did to make you know the, the, all of this is quite abstract in, in some way. And so what we uh, wanted to do to make things a bit more concrete is actually study um, a simulated system of this sort. So uh, to, to uh, simulate its evolution using a stochastic simulation algorithm where we thought of, you know, a system with, let's say, five binding sites here, uh, subject to some protocol where, let's say, a, a cons you know, five binding sites for the same transcription factor, uh, following some protocol where the transcription factor concentration is low, and then we switch it to high, and then there is a long period of when it is high, and then we switch it back to low. So we wanted to observe how such a system would respond. And in particular, uh, we contrasted, you know, a, a, a non-equilibrium version of it. So this is the one that, that has a finite K link and potentially has all these, you know, good phenotypes with, with, with proofreading and so on. And a, a matched equilibrium model matched in the sense that the, the, the TF residence time is, 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 is sort of uh, a match between the two, like our comparison between one and two in the phase diagram. And so uh, here what is shown is the, for, a, for the equilibrium and non-equilibrium model are the simulated rasters. So each row here is a uh, binding site. There is five of them, I said, um, where black means that the TF is occupying the binding site and white means it is not. Um, and so if you, you know, if you look at this, this particular protocol, right, uh, at first that here the concentra TF concentration is low. And so you see mostly white because the sites are mostly unoccupied. And then when TF concentration makes a step, you, you, you have this long uh, stretch of darker, right? Because most of the sites are occupied and then we go back down. And uh, above it, above this raster for both cases, you see the, the orange line and the orange line, uh, you know, denotes whether the mediator um, so the, this whole enhancer is in a collective on state or not, right? So if it's yeah, if it's orange, it's in the on state, and if it's not orange, it's not. And so if you look at at, at this equilibrium model and zooming, you actually have to zoom in um, uh, because the dynamics uh, of uh, TFs uh, binding, unbinding, and, and this mediator switching state is quite fast. So you have to zoom in and, and then you will see that, you know, the, the mediator is off and then it goes on and off and on and so on and so on and fluctuates. You don't see these pauses just because of a graphical plot because, it, you know, this uh, change of state is, is, is so quick for the, for the equilibrium model. And in the non-equilibrium model, this is, um, in, in a way, the, the, this whole dynamic of mediator switching the state is much slower. So you're off and then you commit to going on and then you're off and then you're on for, for kind of longer stretches of time. Um, if you ask now a comparison between of these two models in terms of the specificity, so how, how much would these guy drive expression from five cognate sites, strong binding sites and five random kind of weak binding sites, um, right? And how, how, what specificity the non-equilibrium model would, would achieve. You see the non-equilibrium achieves about order of magnitude improvement for these kind of parameters that we simulated here. Um, you can also see that the, um, 
correlation time, or uh, as you already can note in the plot, the correlation time of these enhancer fluctuations, right, is um, is much longer in the non-equilibrium model. This is precisely reflective of this slow switching, right, between periods of being off and periods of being on. So this is much slower than than what happens in the in this equilibrium matched picture. <clears throat> Now, interestingly, and we were initially puzzled by this, um, the, the, uh, uh, the mediator residence time, the average residence time, so how long are you, um, uh, uh, are you on, is on average actually not, not different between these two. But if you look at the distribution, the distribution of these uh, mediator residence times for the two models, they are very, very different. Right, so for the, uh, the so the, again the mean of these two distributions is actually matched, but for the non-equilibrium model you have you know this long uh, tail right of 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 and these are these long events where you commit to be on and you stay on for a long time, um, and then of course you have many many kind of much shorter events that happen where where you, where you where where the mediator is flickering um, on and off, and you know this is kind of long tailed. Whereas the, so for the equilibrium model, um, I mean, it's not exactly exponential, but this sort of tail is, is roughly, um, roughly exponential. Um, and so if you, you know, if you, if you look at, at the comparison of these two things, you know, the non-equilibrium model has obviously a higher specificity because it can do these sort of proofreading things, but it has a slower, so it has slower mediator switching and thus it will have higher noise levels as, as I will show in, in a second. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the plot. Um, it also results in this, in, in what looks like this bursty expression dynamics, right? You have very many, very short-lived attempts to switch on, but then immediately switch back off, right? Um, but a few very rare, but long commitments to on, right? So when, and essentially that's kind of a, you know, proofreading thing where you, where you commit that you have, you know, that things are, pro the transcription factors are properly bound to the cognate side, you, you then you switch, you know, you switch on, all these links are established, and then you kind of stay there for quite a long time. Um, you have the, the Hill coefficients, the steepnesses of the induction curves are again intermediate. So they're not five, they're, you know, in this case about 2.7 for these two matched models, um, but still somehow they show very cooperative behavior, uh, which I'm not showing the plot, but you know, when you ask things such as what is the distribution of how many, how many TFs are bound conditional on the fact that the system is on, right? And conditional on the fact that the system is off, right? You, you do need, you know, you, you're doing, you're committing when the five guys are on, right? Still doesn't mean that your Hill coefficient is five, which is different than in, in, in sort of equilibrium models. And so if you look at this transient, transient behavior now, so the, before the boxes were for the steady state when the high, a TF concentration, but if you look at the response of these transients, if you uh, if you look at what the model predicts, again equilibrium model is in red and non-equilibrium is is in this uh, pink color, uh, violet color. Um, so the state of the enhancer follows very quickly in the equilibrium model. That's natural because the correlation time of it of, of its fluctuations is also very short. So it can also follow external changes in concentration very quickly, whereas the non-equilibrium model is slower and it's also slower when you switch it off. But, you know, again, you should think of what one can observe in the experiment. If in the experiment you were to observe just the mean protein number that results from this expression and as proteins are long lived, let's say in this case, if you say assume a lifetime of say five hours or something like this, um, they of course completely, you know, they, they kind of average they smooth over this, right? And so on the level of just the mean protein number, you don't see much difference um, uh, between these two behaviors. And if you look at, if you think about the noise in, in expression, um, you, you definitely see that um, say fractional, so this is reported as fractional noise. So this is a fluctuation in expression divided by mean expression. So you see in, in steady state, you see quite substantial amounts of noise, or like 40% fluctuation in, in this simulated case for the non-equilibrium model, and of course very low, uh, very low noise for um, uh, in this case for the, for the equivalent um, equilibrium model. Right, so it's consistent with what we are saying. So that you know you you have reached higher sp uh, specificity, but at the cost of of, of of an increase in noise. Now, of course, uh, 
you know, high noise level is not actually inconsistent with what we often observe in many of these systems, not all, but, but quite a lot of them, right? Where if you want to further reduce the noise, you have to invoke other types of averaging mechanisms and so on. It's not that, you know, we, we know that noise engine expression is, is there in eukaryotes. Um, so differences between equilibrium and non-equilibrium models are not really visible at the level of mean protein, which is this, but uh, they could be visible if you want with live transcriptional imaging that, that looks at the expression state. Um, and there is some in further work to be done on, on noise transients, which are actually quite, quite um, interesting. All right, so let me conclude um, as it was a, a heavy day with talks. So I think what we have studied here is really what we think of one of the simplest non-equilibrium extensions of a well-known mono one man equilibrium model is simplest in the sense that actually there is sort of one extra parameter only. We have studied more complicated versions of this now, and they're quite interesting. For instance, when the stabilization factor alpha is different for transcription factor and the mediator complex, and you can reach other interesting uh, phenotypes. Um, I think, you know, I think one can identify what new maybe is too big of a word, but a, an, an interesting operating regime that could be relevant for eukaryotes. That is a regime where individual TFs have very limited specificity. So they don't distinguish very well between a cognate and non-cognate site. I mean, at least compared to prokaryotes, that the residence time of the individual TFs on these sites can be very short, um, right? Could be uh, as short as seconds, um, where you know, the interesting regime is the regime where this K link, the linking rate is not infinite. So it's not equilibrium, but it is actually roughly K minus the off rate of the transcription factor. In this regime, you observe proofreading and you boost the collective specificity of this transcription machine. Uh, and this leaves no clear signatures in the induction curves. If you do induction curves on wild type strong cognate enhancers, right? Um, there is a trade-off. You can achieve high specificity, but then you, what you pay is noise in gene expression, and this expression becomes bursty, um, which is not inconsistent with the experiments. You get a long switching time scale. So basically, the TF residence time is short. The mediator correlation time is much longer, and it's if you want to really optimize the noise, it's kind of you know, as long as you can push it towards the protein lifetime, but not longer, because otherwise, it, you know, you kind of lose all sorts of, you know, you get a response that, that's not good and all the noise goes through. Um, and you also get not just long noise correlation times, you also get long response time scales that could be measurable via live MRA, MRA transcriptional imaging. Um, so enhancers commit to long periods of activity. Um, and this, you know, could is not inconsistent with some of the some of the measurements. Uh, if you, of course, we, I mean, this is very hand wavy because you know we, we did not specifically um, include, say, enhancer uh, promoter contacts. We did not specifically include uh, uh, you know formation of various droplets and so on. But it's not inconceivable that you commit to a longer um, lasting uh, state that's conducive to transcriptions. Um, optimal heal coefficients in this regime are, you know, roughly half of the number of binding sites that you have, not the number of the binding sites, and the required concentrations uh, that you need to induce the uh, transcription from cognate site uh, would be higher than what is predictive in very cooperative equilibrium models. So the, I don't know if you are familiar with the terms, there has been this paradigm of called the enhancerosome, which you can think of our equilibrium limit with very strong cooperativity, right? So where really TFs come there, they, they, they form some complex maybe with a mediator and everything sticks together for a long time because of these cooperative interactions. In that limit, you would get very, you know, basically the cooperative, the Hill coefficient would be equal to the number of binding sites, the cooperativity would be very steep and so on. This is not this, is not this regime, right? Um, and so uh, again, you know, these new models have essentially only one extra parameter compared to equilibrium models. They're fully probabilistic models. They can be inferred from upcoming experimental data. We actually tried, we just didn't, we didn't report it because the work is not completely done yet. 
And this enables us to really turn the crank when we connect to data of the sort of full Bayesian formalism. We could try to do model selection, compare equilibrium versus non-equilibrium scenarios and so on. But this is all for future work. So I will stop here. Um, thanks for your attention. And if you still have uh, stamina for any further questions, I'm uh, at, at your disposal. Thank you. Great, Gaspar. Thanks a lot. Um, question.